currently with the Kansas City Star. He's been there about three and a half years, and before that he was in St. Louis for 25 years. But uh, he's from Pennsylvania originally. I talked to him earlier, so he's a Philadelphia Phillies fan. Luckily, they're not in the NLCS against the Cubs, so I guess you know we're, we're fine. Um, his undergrad is from Penn. His master's is uh, from Missouri. So all you local Missouri Tigers, I'm sure you're happy about that. Uh, so with that, but hey, the program is all yours. Thanks, President Peter. I hope I'm getting the uh, terminology right. And thanks to all of you for your great service and work. I feel the need to start by saying that this is approximately um, the 40th anniversary of my first exposure to Rotary, uh, which came in a little town I grew up in, Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, at the uh, Inglenook restaurant where I was a busboy. Um, and I always wondered what all these people were doing, and I continue to learn. And it's, uh, it's really wonderful what you do for all of us in our community. Um, I thought I would start and tell you just a little bit more about my background, um, and then we can talk about the Olympics, and then I guess at the end, uh, we'll take some questions too, if we have time. Um, first of all, let's start with my name. My name is Vahe Gregorian. It's an Armenian name. Um, some of you may uh, know of other Armenians. Unfortunately, it's the Kardashians that are dominating the headlines right now. They are, they are our people. Um, my first name is uh, easily confused. Um, most of the time when people hear it, they kind of want to hear something familiar, so quite often I'll shake hands with somebody and they'll say, nice to meet you, Bob. Um, and I debate when it's worth explaining how to say it. Uh, somebody once thought my name was Foghead. Um, to this day, if I run into her, she like runs away before she can make eye contact. Um, I could help everybody with my name if, if I use the accent that's actually in it. But we had a bit of a computer glitch during my 25 years in St. Louis where it just, it's not worth explaining why, but it didn't work out. And now I feel like if I added the accent, I would just look like this pretentious guy adding an accent to his name. So I just try to grind it out. Um, so I, I, was, I want you to know I came here from the ends of the earth, actually. I, I was born in Beirut. My father's from Iran, my mom's from New Jersey. They met in school in California. And back when you could still do this, they went to uh, Lebanon um, in the early 60s so he could go to Afghanistan to work on his dissertation. And that's why I'm here in Kansas City today. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, the, the long and short of the road is that we, my dad's an academician and um, he's still at 82 going strong. Um, and we moved quite a lot. We were in California um, and then Texas where I really started falling in love with sports um, from a young age. He was teaching at the University of Texas and I got to go down to the stadium a couple times and um, it just got it in my blood. Um, started playing Pop Warner football, even though the first game we ever played, we lost to the hated Yellow Jackets, 79 to nothing, and I, I still wanted to play. Um, so we moved on to Pennsylvania and I did mostly grow up there and um, continued getting more and more into sports. Um, and I think this is in the rotary spirit, and I, I, I don't know what you all will think of this, but I, I had uh, many lessons in sports that I think are important that we can carry with us everywhere. Um, one that I got in football in high school was, I was thinking about this this morning, um, I was a wide receiver, and I remember uh, in workouts, a, a teammate dropping a pass and me being kind of happy. Like, oh yeah, Tim dropped that pass, that, that's good for me. And I really remember truly feeling ashamed of myself a few minutes later and deciding right then and there that whatever happens for me happens for me, but it's not gonna be because I'm rooting against friends or teammates. So I'm just, and, and I think I've tried to let that guide me in a lot of ways since then. And I think it's a useful thought for all of, us, all of us to have. I mean, I know we compete in business, we compete in sports, but I feel like I'm my best self when I'm just cognizant of the fact that I'm really just competing against myself and I try to hold myself to that all the time. Um, from there, I, I, went, I did, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I uh, was an English major, which some of you who may have been English majors may have had the similar experience that I had, which was I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I, I thought about teaching and coaching. I still think about teaching and coaching, but it didn't take then. I did play football. Um, 
And the expression I use is I played left out because I really didn't get to play much. But it was a tremendous experience. Uh, we had horrible teams for a couple of years. We won two games in three years. Then my senior year, we won the Ivy League championship. Um, my wife always reminds me that it was a three-way tie and an eight-team league and maybe not that big a deal. But, but to us, it was a very big deal. And, um, and that was another sort of lesson through sports I, I came to have. I didn't get to play much. Um, but my relationships with those guys uh, on the team and feeling like you were part of something bigger than yourself and wanting to do your role, whatever that role may be, was really meaningful to me. Um, and I see that today in relationships we have with people at the paper. We, we do get to know people in other departments at the paper, but mostly I see friends in sports. And a number of times, three, four, five of us are working together on the same project. And it's uh, incredibly energizing to know that everybody's looking out for everybody else. Who gets to write what story, how you go about it, how you think of plans. I can point to any number of stories that have worked out or not worked out. and recognize that they were collaborative in a lot of ways, whether it was through the editing process or the ideas process. Um, I'll get back to that when we talk about the Olympics in just a minute. Um, so I get done with college, don't quite know what I want to do. Next thing you know, I'm working for Pop Warner Football in an office in Philadelphia that I didn't really study very well. It turned out there were only three employees full time and um, I was the new guy and, and I ended up just typing envelopes and. Um, not doing anything really for a year and finally deciding I had to figure something else out. And then suddenly I'm a marketing rep at a grocery warehouse in South Philly. I keep talking big about writing and I finally have to take the grad school plunge. And um, I applied to the University of Missouri and I applied to Columbia in New York. And I went to go take an exam for Columbia at the house of an, of an alum. And this will date you to show you how far back this goes. I had to take my typewriter with me. and. I swear this is true, I, I get in, reach into my car for the typewriter and I split my pants. And I remember thinking right then and there, this Columbia thing isn't gonna work out. And it turns out Columbia wanted you to already know what you were doing with journalism. And, and I say this in the best of ways about Missouri. Missouri, I thought, wanted people with other experiences to be around it and you learn your journalism there. And one reason or another, I got in Missouri, I didn't get in Columbia, and it was also probably the best thing that ever happened to me because it let me get out on my own. Uh, here I am in my mid-20s feeling like I really hadn't made a big decision of my own before in a lot of ways. So, um, and Missouri was great for me. Uh, very hands-on experience. I don't know how many Missouri, uh, University of Missouri people are here, or how yeah. many KU people are here, uh, but welcome everybody. And, um, and, and so that, that was a, a, a great time in my life. And, um, one thing led to another that morphed into an internship at the Post-Dispatch in St. Louis that uh, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who applied for that internship because other people were applying for like the Washington program and I think things that fit them better. And I've often wondered, you know, what happened if somebody else applied, <laughs> somebody else applied and I didn't get that because that led to really kind of everything else. That turned into a full-time job. Um, then, you know, covering high schools and then covering uh, University of Illinois, then covering Missouri a lot. And then around the mid-90s, um, this all went to kind of a different tier when I got to cover the Olympics for the first time. And that was the, the Atlanta Olympics, and I've covered everyone since, except for uh, Russia in 2014. And um, other than the experience of the Royals the last two months, uh, last two years, I should say, uh, covering, covering the Olympics, is um, just on a tier of its own for, for me professionally as, as both a, a challenge and uh, just all-consuming event. Um, really kind of out-of-body experience, especially when it's in a place like China or um, any place that the time zones are substantially different because your day there is still going while there, the day here is also stopping and, and it, it it just doesn't work out for any sleep. Um, and, but such incredible things that you, you get to see, and I, I assume many of you watch the Olympics and enjoy the Olympics, and, and, and if you do, probably part of what moves you is the idea of your reach exceeding your grasp, of being able to be something more than any of us think you can do. Um, and I'm constantly struck by that. And even though many of these athletes are actually professionals now, 
there is something different about why they do the Olympics, I think, and maybe I'm naive, but then the reward of financial reward that many can get from it. And it, it's something we see, I guess every two years is really the way to put it, but really every four years for the Summer Olympics. So I've been fortunate to see um, events like Michael Phelps won his eighth gold medal. And uh, I can tell you that that is the first and only time uh, in this profession that I found myself crying after I finished the story because I felt like, <laughs> and I was there with my dear friend Joe Posnanski, who many of you remember from here, Joe and I were sitting alongside each other, and long story short, we had a deadline something like 22 minutes after after it was over, and you, we all found ourselves thinking, well, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened in sports, and what we what we write has to, you know, match that. Um, I got stuck in the press conference. I literally couldn't get out of the room, and there were, I think, a thousand people in a, in a room for 400 people, and I physically couldn't get out of the room. And I ended up having to get a USOC person to help me pretend I was sick to go through Chinese security and then run back to the computer and type some dribble and uh, send it in. And it, I, I don't know if I'm explaining, I don't even know why I'm telling you that I cried, but it just, just so you know that you, it becomes very emotional for maybe for the things you see, but also for the things you feel you have to do. Um, so after London in 2012, when I was at the Post Dispatch, I, I sort of that was probably it for the Olympics. I didn't, I don't think the Post Dispatch is going to cover it anymore. And at that point, I didn't know I'd be coming to the Star. Um, in 2013, I heard from the Star about a column job, and we were very comfortable in St. Louis. I, some people may not think that this is possible, but you can like St. Louis and Kansas City, and they've both been great places for us. Um, but we didn't, we didn't really want to leave. Um, our neighbors were our best friends, and. But I always liked Kansas City, and, and ultimately my wife and I um, understood the difference in this job that, that I get to do a lot of different things, and so would she in her job. She's the house home editor at the Star. Um, and we kind of looked at each other finally and said, adventure, uh, yeah, let's do it. So we came over in the summer of 2013, um, and there were some bad omens when we didn't, and this, and it's gonna probably make people laugh, but it was horrible at the time. We, the night we arrived here, we came with four cats and two dogs, and one of the cats died on the way over. And, and our, the first thing we did in Kansas City when we arrived was sit on our back porch weeping, like, what have we done? We just killed our cat to move here. And I can't even believe I'm smiling about it. That was how we felt at the time. But then, uh, and we've got some Hyde Park neighbors in the audience, uh, we live in Hyde Park, and, and we found that to be a really welcoming area, front porch neighborhood where people were inviting us in before they knew us, and just felt right. And I bet you there's 20 neighborhoods here where we would have felt right, but that, that was the one for us. And we are about eight minutes from everything, including down at the paper. Um, just to circle back to the Olympics again, so then 2016 comes up, um, and lo and behold, the star decides to still make the commitment to go to the Olympics, and uh, this was fraught. We were really, I was really worried in ways I never had been before about how the Olympics would work. A lot of Olympics, you have a thing or two to worry about. You kind of don't get what's going to happen. Even Athens in 2004, you, Athens was thought to be a major security risk. But you sort of had faith in the, in the security system, sort of. You didn't know. Um, but I remember even reporters were being told that we should take black jackets and gas masks to Athens. And a friend of mine interviewed a security expert who said, don't do that. If you put on a gas mask during an attack, A, people are gonna kill you trying to get the gas mask, B, um, they're gonna think you did it. So I, I just let go and, and left stuff here and you know, had faith. Um, but Rio had so many things going on, as many of you might recall, whether it was issues with the water, other environmental issues, government meltdown, economic meltdown, crime. Um, you really wondered how you were gonna get through. And the single thing that I worried about most all along was the thing that would inhibit me most from doing the job, which is transportation. And that turned out to be the only thing that really was a problem. Um, I think what the media, and I, I think I was complicit in this by passing this along without really understanding it, the media didn't really frame this right, that the crime it's a lot like crime in any other place, not to diminish how important it is and how terrible crime is, but it is pretty isolated in certain places. Probably the people coming to Rio in the main areas, whether it's Copacabana or other, other major areas of tourism, 
weren't going to be you know, attacked by roving bands of gunmen. And I think a lot of people thought that. And in my experience, a lot of families of athletes didn't go because they were worried about, not about Zika, but about health, about, about crime. So that was, uh, that was too bad. And in, in hindsight, I wish we'd all been more responsible in framing that. I think people could have gone to the Olympics and had a great time. One other thing I should say about covering the Olympics is it's we, the way we do it, the way most media do it, is we create a plan knowing we're gonna tear that plan right up. Um, so about three weeks before we left, in conjunction with other with editors and everybody at the paper, I had sort of a plan for a couple things every day at the Olympics. Not really knowing the logistics yet, but just knowing here's where we're gonna start, knowing things are gonna change, knowing there will be things like um, the moronic Ryan Lochte doing what he did and that that will change everything. Um, but that, that's how it works. And the, the best part of that is you have a plan to tear up and you know you can, you can adjust. And I think of this too, we were talking about this earlier today. Last year at this time, it's the sixth inning or so of the Royals game against the Astros. And we have emailed around a plan for what we're all writing. Sam Mellinger is going to write about how the Royals' best season in 35 years was meaningless because they failed in the playoffs. I'm going to write about how all their September moves backfire. And then it's the eighth inning, and they keep getting hits. And now we are really lucky that was a day game because if we had had to revise all that on the fly, that would not have, that would, there would have been a lot of, or so it seemed in our articles uh, before we could rewrite them. So that's the way the Olympics works. Um, the, one of the very best things, if not the best thing, I name dropped some of the great things I've gotten to see, but in all candor, the, the, the beauty and glory for, for me anyway, and I think for many reporters in covering the Olympics, is getting to know your local athletes. That's what you really build around. And that is the most gratifying thing because these are people you can have a relationship with, you can really understand what they go through, who they are, what they're about, and even get to know their families. Um, this particular Olympics, I had that uh, just awesome experience with two families from here. One really from here, Wellington, Missouri, I think we can call that here. Uh, it was an archer named Zach Garrett who um, he got a silver medal in the in the uh, archery team event. Well, we'd gotten to know Zach a little bit before it, enough so that we went out to the family farm and saw the roots of where his grandfather gave him a, a bow he carved him when he was four, and that led to all this. So spent a day with Zach's mom and dad, and as it happened, for some reason, Zach's mom, Robin, was saving me a seat at, during the Olympics to sit next to her during this. That never happens. I, I, it, that, it, it, so it was the most unique perspective you could, to me that you could possibly have and feel and sort of feel like you were feeling it in sense around and, and and Robin thankfully also does not really mind. I mean, I'd ask her, is there, you know, you on the record? I didn't want to put it that way, but you know, I want to make sure it was okay with her that we were. I was, she understood I was going to document what she was saying, and it was it was just great. She was she was a lovely person and so sad. I really liked the family and added a lot to, I think, what we could bring back. Um, another fellow, Jaden Cox, he's a University of Missouri guy. He's not, he's not from here, he's from Columbia, but we treat that as our coverage area. Jaden is one of the most charismatic, interesting guys I've ever come across. Um, and he's a wrestler. But before he's a wrestler, he's, he's a man of, of many other talents, and one of which was during all the racial strife that, that came to light last year in Columbia, they turn to Jaden, an African-American wrestler, and say, Jaden, why don't you uh, write us a song um, and play it for us at the Billion Dollar Fundraiser, because we think you know how to draw out what's best. So Jaden Cox goes and interviews probably 50 students, and if you ever get a moment and just want to type in his name, it's J-apostrophe-D-E-N-C-O-X, uh, and um, One Mizzou, I think is what the song was. Just take 90 seconds and watch this, this elegant young man singing this song that speaks to so much of the strife and difficulty and which is such grace. So he's a, he's a guy to pay attention to and I got to know him. We got his mother and Jaden singing for us for a, a, a video we did. And now comes his time in Rio and doesn't go well. He, uh, 
He gets in the, in the, he loses his third match, I believe, which puts him out of gold medal contention. And you're sort of thinking, well, what's the story gonna be? He's, he's going for a bronze, what's the big deal about a bronze? Well, it, in my mind, it actually became a better story because of the way he carried himself, the way he had to come back from the, the, the major disappointment, the injury it turned out he was having, and because of his just overall dignity. Um, what I'll remember most about talking to Jaden after, after he won the bronze medal was asking him about stuff he was doing in between, like helping up his opponent and hugging the guy, be the one to reach out to hug the opponent and beat him, initiating that. And he talked about his rivals as brothers, that nobody can understand each other more than brothers um, or sisters, depending on the event, naturally. And I thought there was something really beautiful in that. And in fact, after he finished talking about it, a friend of mine from Sports Illustrated who had been listening to somebody else asked me if I, if he, if I would mind transcribing, when I transcribed that part of the tape to send him those words, he wanted to make sure he, he used them and the people sort of saw that, the beauty in that, that I think we forget about too many times where we feel the need to uh, demean or diminish or demonize our, our opponents. Um, so, with that, I think we're closing in on time to take questions, and I'm kind of out of breath, so um, maybe we should take questions if anybody has them uh, about what we do at the Star, or what I do, or the Olympics specifically. Yes, sir. Carl? You know, I mean, our, my family's been taking the paper for 90 years. We, we don't miss Every morning at 5 o'clock, I go down behind my door and the paper. I read your column, and I read most of them. You we've got some great writers here. Have been for years, you know, for years. Somebody's got to feed that paper because it's starving. I mean, if you look at it every morning, it gets a little small. A little small, a little small. Uh, we don't want him to die. Uh, what What's the outfit? You know, basically, I come there. We come there every month because we have our our uh, mayor for a breakfast meeting there, and we meet everybody and all. They're great people, but is there a chance of this thing going out? Uh, you know, we don't know what to think of. Well, I'll tell you on, on a few fronts. You know, across the newspaper business. We've been hearing for decades about what newsprint costs us, on one hand. On the other hand, we're hearing about the digital world taking over and what poorer readers is, is after. On the other hand, there's people like you and me, and hopefully a lot of people in this room, who feel like you need 24 hours in the life of the world right here. And it, I, I would be uh, misleading if I didn't say it pains me to see that that's the course of events. I will tell you that it's it's my understanding that the, the plan is that we, we, the newspaper business, ultimately feel like it's going to be more and more digitally oriented, that there's an enormous amount of content, I, I don't even like using that word, but that's, that's the word we're using today, good stories is what I mean to say, uh, online, and I've come to realize that, that forces way beyond my capacity to reason are in play here. and just determined to believe that, that a lot of people a lot smarter and more informed on the mechanics and dynamics of this are the ones at the helm. But I don't feel like I know how to answer that question in a way that can in any way satisfy it. And it does look hungry. I mean, I, I know. Um, I wish I had a better answer. It is, and believe me, you know, we've got enough people uh, that think print first still, and, and some of us, I, I think that might be seen as to our detriment, you know, we need to be thinking for 24 hour news organization, everything, and I, I've learned to do that. I, I've learned to blog, I've learned to tweet, I've learned to, I've learned to, to do videos, apparently videos are a big deal now. Um, so we're just trying to stay nimble. And one of the things I will tell you this as writers, and, and, and I talk about this with a lot of colleagues, when we, sort of try to just clear out the brush around us and, and think about the essence of what we're doing. Yeah, there's a few more distractions, a few more things you don't really like to do. It's a little, or more conditioned to doing, I should say. But by and large, a lot of the essence of what we still do and get to do feels pretty familiar and pretty invigorating still. I mean, I, I still feel like I just need to learn. I don't even, 
Container is a term I've heard used. I need to not worry about what container it's going or where it's going. I need to do my best work possible and understand that there's a home for that um, while still wishing that, that uh, the paper would just grow and grow in, in print. Yeah, thank you. Can we hold our questions until maybe after the program? We're gonna wrap up right now. So I'm sure by hey, boom, might stay a few minutes. Some people may come up and ask some specific questions for you to sure. like, like, conclude our program today. So um, first, um, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, so that's a, a certificate acknowledging that you spoke in front of um, one of the largest rotary clubs in the, in the, in the Kansas City area.